Do I have talked about parts of it here, along with some other things, but that, so, it's been over 20 years now. Uh, when I was preparing for this era to do this, this Sabbath, I went back into my previous list and tried to find, when was the last time I preached that? And I was surprised, 20 years. So I figured we're doing the Psalms this quarter. I'll do my, one of my favorite Psalms. And I want to start off with asking a question. Now, I know most of you, but is there anybody here in the congregation today who doesn't know me, who maybe this is the first time you're hearing me speak? So we're all, all friends. That's good. Maybe somebody online. Maybe that's the bottom line we're going to reach to. Or maybe I'm still reaching you. Maybe still there's something that you say, I'm a follower of Christ, but there was something you missed about the gospel that might turn the light on today. All right? And you don't have to answer to me about that. I want you to take it to, to the Lord. Okay? We have struggles in our journey. Everything's not uniform. Some days are better than others. Some days you're better than others. <laughs> you want to present the right face to society, right? You want, to, you want them to see Jesus in you, right? Amen. And then sometimes they don't. You feel defeated. Other times you might find yourself in a situation. You know, give you an idea. 30, over 30 years ago, I tried to start a little business. And I ran against a wall. And I couldn't make it go. And I went down in defeat. And I prayed to God that time. And I'm so out of the church, I hadn't returned. Remember, I'm on my 22-year journey. But I'm standing by the big front window to the little store I had. And I said, it's like looking through the glass, Lord. And you can't touch the other side. And like Asaph in this psalm, he who has given himself to God and kept his hands pure and away from evil is looking out into the world and seeing the wicked, the unbelievers, living great lives. They got the houses. They got the cars. Okay, they didn't have an engine in them at that time. But you know what I mean. What you look out on, and they have the life. And you're giving yourself to God. Trusting he'll take care of you. And you have such little to show for it. And you seem to think that maybe they got the better deal. That they are the ones who are really having the better life. And you come into that moment of doubt, question, about your own journey. And I want us to think a little bit about the journey we're all on, however young, however old, however new to the journey you are, you know that it is just that. Where you are as a Christian is not a destination. That's in the future. But that's the road we're traveling on. That's why we sing songs like Jacob's Ladder. I'm going, we sing. You come with me as we journey to the city. Abraham did not receive the promise, in Hebrews 11 tells us, but he saw that city in the, in the front of him in the future, yeah. that city which had foundations. You know what that means? It means that he's looking for a real city, not pie in the sky, yeah. not the proverbial El Dorado. He's looking for that real place that God had prepared, that he is the builder of, and not man. He's looking for a real place. But he didn't receive the promise in his lifetime. It's to be in the future. So we have these questions, we have these doubts, we have these up and downs in our life. And Asaph had the same thing. And so you know how I am about notes, right? I don't usually like notes. But here are my notes. It's just simply the chapter out of Psalms, chapter 73. And that's your text today. Turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 73. We'll use some other Bible text, but 
This is our main text today. Because he covers the story. And the, the words we had read this morning, where he says that surely God is good to Israel. Surely, he's, I think he's trying to convince himself, surely God is good to Israel. To those who are pure in heart. He says, but as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. He says, my steps had almost slipped. Why? For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says, there's no pains in their death, and their body is fat. I like the old African stories that when they see a big guy, they know he's successful. He's got to be the king because he gets food. So I know if I went over there, I'd fit right in. <laughs> hey, hey, don't be laughing. <laughs> but here he sees the same thing. They're not without food. They're not lacking. He says, their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men. You've been in trouble, right? Financial trouble. How are we going to make the mortgage or the rent next month? You know, we're going to get enough food on the table. Pay that doctor bill. I got to have my medication. Things of that nature. And we're struggling month in, month out. You know? And here, they don't have that kind of trouble. Right? Here, here's the, what, I owe this, here it is. I can just give it to you. They're okay. He says, they're not plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. The pride is their necklace. They are too successful for God. You met them? Everything is going well in life. You got everything you need. And you even got the girl. And so you don't need God. Not until something else comes in and happens. You start to think you need God. That was the condition of the Laodicean church, you know. There in Revelation chapter 3. They were in need of nothing, right? Why? Because they were self-sufficient. They were rich. You know, when they had a major earthquake, we're talking about the real city of Laodicea, back in the day of that first century, and Rome was going to send out some money to help them fix up their city. And they said, no, we'll take care of it. We got enough. How arrogant they were. They were so arrogant that their clothes were not the robe of Christ, but their own. So self-sufficient that when they had the congregation meet for church, Jesus was outside the door. And the door was locked. They didn't even need Jesus. We're so, oh, we got it. We're cool. We'll take it from here. And that's how they were. And that's how the wicked are. They don't know. That's not for you to judge them. Oh, you're the wicked. I'm the good. That's what happens a lot of times when we come into relationship with Christ. We join a congregation. We're on the right path. We're the people of God. And now they feel, since they are in the high seat, that they have a right to, one, treat you badly if you're not like them, and to judge you. So much of that going on in the church. Our church, their church, anywhere you have church. They have this thing going on. We, I, you know me, I'm a historian. I like to read the history, and I, like, and I know the history of our church. I read the story, for instance, of uh, Albion Fox Ballinger. Anybody know that name? He was one of the early criti critics of the Sanctuary Doctrine. They had his trial in 1905. We were just moved out to Tacoma Park, Maryland. So it was basically in a little building. Uh, most of that stuff they had out there was tents. And after they disfellowshipped him, kicked him out, his wife, who had just come into town with him, none of the churches would accept her. Well, why? She wasn't the one guilty of heresy. Why was she locked out of the churches? Just because she was his wife? I thought our own personal experiences were important. But evidently, we as a church judged her she was unworthy to be part of the family. Don't 
judge anybody. And I'm not just saying that blank is a blanket statement. Because when you judge them, you're judging whether or not they're worthy to hear the gospel. Who's not worthy to hear the gospel? Who would you omit? Who would you not, Hitler, would you not tell Hitler the gospel? Oh, he was a bad guy. Would you tell him? Mussolini, Stalin. We could go down a whole list of people, couldn't we? Are you going to withhold the gospel from them? They're bad. They're not worthy to hear that stuff. And God forbid they become my neighbor in heaven, right? <laughs> who's worthy and who's not worthy to hear the gospel? We have to realize why we are Christians, why we're here. And sometimes it's not what we think it is. You know, at the heart of this lesson, and I almost retitled this thing, that Jesus did not die for good people. You know that? We're going to see that here in this, in this chapter. Then I'm going to take you to the New Testament. So here he is. He's all worried. He's not just jealous of the, of the, of the wicked, where he, he said he almost fell, almost slipped into their, you know, to give up God because they were having it so good. But his question centered on what theologians like to call a theodicy. Anybody ever hear of theodicy? My wife's waving her hand. Ooh, 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 I know. <laughs> it's from two Greek words coined in the 1700s. Theos is the word for God, and decay is the word for righteous or right. Theodicy is the subject looking for the righteousness or justice of God. You know, when the atheist says a tsunami hit, 100,000 people died, where was, where was God when all those innocent people died that were there in that, in that flood or whatever? They're asking a question of judgment and justice. And in a way, Asaph was doing the same thing. It's like, hey, God, I'm the one on your side. I'm the one who's kept my hands clean and that I'm not out doing bad things. And yet I'm the one struggling. I'm the one living in the dark, it seems. And they're out there shining like they're brand new, living in these nice places, living a great life. Something's not right here. Where's your justice, God? That's kind of like what he's asking. It's a, it's a very deep question. It's a very deep position to be in. And the answers don't come readily. Not if you're just thinking. How many people have we talked to, they got an idea about something, and they say, I think such and such. And I tell them, well, I don't know that I'm interested in what you think, what the scriptures say. That's what we want. We want to go to scripture. What does the scripture say? He began to learn that. What did I leave off in the text? Verse 7. Continuing talking about the wicked, their eyes bulge from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. And they speak on on high. Talk about oppression. They might be speaking about the oppression of the church. I saw a little videotape here recently. A young lady was accusing the, the Christian church of writing the Bible. She says that the Bible was written by white men. You ever hear such a notion? Yeah. That's amazing. It's all of the people who wrote scripture were brown. <laughs> no, no white people wrote the scripture. But this is their ignorance, is they mock what they don't know. So, they, the wicked, speak on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens. We, we met some Christians that way. I just talked about them. They set themselves on high. Their tongues parade through the earth, and therefore his people return to this place, and waters of abundance we, we are drunk, uh, are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the most high? Behold. These are the wicked, and always at ease they have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure 
and wash my hands in innocence. Anytime you feel like that, I'm tired of having egg on my face. I'm tired of coming up short. This thing, this God thing, isn't, doesn't seem to be working because they're out there more successful than me. How's your journey going? We need to ask each other that more. It might be a good thing to start journaling, do a little journal. You don't have to write a lot, you know, a couple sentences. You don't have to write a whole page. And it might help you think about your journey and where you're at on it and know how your journey is not static. I know where I'm at today. Compared to where I was 25 years ago when I returned to Christ. I'm not perfect by a long shot. But I know I'm not where I was when I came back. And if he can be that far, he can take me all the way home. And to do the same for you. So here he is. Asaph is in a quandary. Verse 14, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. And then he makes a change. Until what? Verse 17. Until I came into the sanctuary of God. No, what's that mean? He just walked into a building and it hit him? What was going on in the sanctuary of God? It was there, he said, and then I perceived their end, what, what they're going to end is. What does the sanctuary do? It tells us God's plan, right? We refer to the sanctuary, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the gospel in a sandbox sometimes. You know, we see our preachers use those terms. It's the miniature view of God telling you how he's going to save you and restore all things, put things back the way they were before sin came in. And now he's there. He's there in the sanctuary. Now, this is during the time of David. So there is no building for him to go into. The sanctuary is still a tent. In fact, at that time, it's barely a tent. Because I know where the ark is at this time. He perceived their end. He began to understand when he let God teach him. Surely, he says, you set them, the wicked, in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. And how they are destroyed in a moment, they are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream, when one awakes, O oh Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. And when my heart was embittered, and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant, and I was like a beast before you. He's coming to another term, and not just knowing that the wicked are going to get their comeuppance. You know, because that's not what we're about as Christians. Yeah, I can't wait till you get yours. Is that what God wants from us? No. You know, when we read in Revelation, chapter 19, those first 10 verses, we get the word hallelujah four times. Why? The saints have been delivered from the beast system on earth, and they're in heaven praising God that they've been delivered from the beast system. Okay. They're not celebrating because the beast system is dead. They're not celebrating because of what happened to the beast system, they're celebrating that they have been separated and they're free from it. Amen. That's what they're celebrating. Amen. And as Christians, we shouldn't look at the wicked world as if now God's going to give their comeuppance. Even with Adventist soteriology and eschatology, we have done a little of that as a church, corporately speaking. The, the seven last plagues. God's wrath is finally going to pour out on those wicked people. What, God is mad at them? Because they didn't pick him? So he's going to pour his wrath upon them. That's how they view it. God's wrath is 
coming after you. And here we see more than just the fact that they have a bad end. But he saw that he was a beast before God. The bottom line is you and I are no different than the wicked world. You're not better. He didn't save you because you were good. Hey, you're gooder than that person. I'm going to let you come in and not that person. Is that what he's doing? But what separates us from the rest of the world? Can't be our goodness. We don't have any. It's the next word in the next verse. In verse 23, that one word that begins... Nevertheless. That's the whole gospel right there. That's the good news. Amen. Nevertheless. I'm in the same boat you are going down. I'm not good. We're not really any different fundamentally speaking. But nevertheless. He says, I am continually with you, God. Why? Because we believed. Amen. And you have taken hold of my right hand. God holds us by the right hand like a small child. It didn't say we hold God's hand. A small child holds mama's hand, and their hand can slip off. But when mom's got a hold of their hand, that kid isn't going anywhere but where mama goes. Right? God has us by our right hand. Amen. Amen. That's our difference. That's our difference. And our message to the world is, hey, you can be held by the right hand of God. That's our message. Not you're finally going to get your comeuppance. But I got a message, man, that you don't have to have that end that the wicked are going to have. That end isn't punishment because of their unbelief. It's the result of their unbelief. That's right. It's simply where it goes. In God is life. Outside of God is on life. And we need to invite people into life okay. and enlarge the kingdom. It's after that he begins to grow in his understanding. You have taken hold of my right hand, and with your counsel, God, you will guide me. He will direct our life. And afterwards, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? He says, and beside you, I desire nothing on earth. And so all the things he's lacking, that the rich, that the rich have and the, and the wicked have, we didn't want it in the first place. That's right. My flesh, my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I may come near to slipping God. I may not be on the path all, but I still remember 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. He who says there's, he has no sin is a liar. There's no truth in him. And then verse 9, that he who confesses his sin God is faithful and just to forgive him his sin, yeah. to cleanse him from all unrighteousness. Yeah. And so we know that God is our strength. Behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. Is God's nearness to you your good? Or do you resent it? I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your words. And there's the end. There's the message. That's the call to go preach, to share with others about God, how God is our stronghold. He is our refuge. And we'll tell others about God's work. And that's the message out of Psalm 73. So go with me now to the New Testament. To the, God, to, the, to the epistle to the Romans, chapter 5. And 
Uh, I spoke a lot on chapter five. This ought to be a review for some, which is good. Others may not remember or may not have known what this is. But this is the heart and soul of the gospel. To understand this is to really begin to understand your relationship to God, to your salvation, to works, and all that. So we can just realize who we are. And when we share the message, we can share the message in humility, not in arrogance. All right? Chapter 5 begins with the results of justification. Paul has just spent the first four chapters talking about what salvation is. And now we're at the culmination of what it is. And that very first verse kind of says it right there. Therefore, that's a concluding statement. After everything I just said in four chapters, therefore, having been, past tense, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you have peace? Amen. Or are you still resisting? And I don't mean peace as in being solemn and laid back. I mean, before that, we were at war with God. We had picked up weapons against God. But now that we have been justified and come into relationship with God and have a new position with God, we have laid our weapons down. And the peace we're talking about here is like a peace treaty. Now, it doesn't mean we don't mess up, but we're not in rebellion anymore. We're not fighting against God. And that's where we are, and that's the result of our salvation. And that's the journey that you should be on right now. Amen. If you don't have peace with God right now, talk to me or talk to the pastor, because you can have peace right now Amen. about your relationship with God. He begins to tell us about what is important. I call it, on those first 12 verses, the objective gospel. The objective gospel is the good news that Christ did for us outside of us. In other words, in our lostness, he didn't ask you if it was okay. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to do this, but you need to do something first. He didn't say that. It's about what he did while we were yet in our mess. It's already accomplished, and then he tells us what's going on. And then we can come into it. And that's called the subjective gospel. Subjective is when you bring it to yourself and experience it. At that moment, you enter into salvation. But here's the objective gospel. And it begins here with verse 5 about what he has done for us. Verse 5. And hope does not disappoint because of the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the law, uh, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For a while, in verse 6, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. at the right time. You see, it was up to us to solve the problem between the, what the wicked had and our relationship to God. We are the ones who had to reconcile. It was human beings who broke the, 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 the connection to God. It was on them to come back. You ever have anybody in your history do you wrong and you're still waiting for them to come back and apologize? Well, if God was waiting for that, it'd be a long time. And so, while we were weak, while we were helpless, he did for us what we could not do on our own. He affected the reconciliation. He died on Calvary. And he died there for ungodly people. He didn't say, get straight first, do the best you can. We were on godly people 
that he died for. He didn't die for good people. And so we are not in a position of deserving. I deserve such and such. Or I should be held this way in view of other people. We're like anybody else on the planet. But we're connected to Christ now, hopefully. Anybody don't feel they're connected, again, talk to me or talk to your pastor. So while we were helpless, at the right time, Christ died. He died for the ungodly. He died for you. Talking to uh, Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, remember that midnight meeting? You know, you know who Nicodemus was. He was, uh, the head, he was on the Sanhedrin. And it wasn't just, in fact, that he was at the Jerusalem court. In all of Israel, that was like at Jerusalem was being on the Sanhedrin court. I mean, this is who he's, he's talking to, a justice. And the man was very wealthy. In today's standards, he, Nicodemus might have been a billionaire. Very wealthy, in a proper position. And so he comes and talks to this itinerant preacher he's been hearing about at night because he doesn't want people catching him, talking to him just yet. And Jesus, this is where we get the famous text we've all memorized, right? John 3.16. And Jesus tells him, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. I came to save that which was lost. Jesus wasn't on a condemnation mission. He was on a rescue mission. I come to save that which was lost. That's what he was there for. Who was all lost in the world? Everybody. So when we think about the cross and who Jesus died for, we know he didn't die for good people. It was those people who were the object of his cross. That's what he's telling Nicodemus. The object of my death on Calvary are those who are steeped in sin. And if you had found yourself steeped in sin, you were the object of what Jesus was coming after. You know, people say, I don't deserve to be saved. If God knew half the things I did, he wouldn't do, you know, wouldn't even talk to me. Well, believe me, God knows everything you did. And he knows more than that. He knows everything because you probably forgot a few things. You know, he knows it all. And so you qualify. You're the ungodly. You're the object of his cross. That's the one who died for. He, he stresses it there in verse 8 when he talks about, look, somebody might die. And remember, in the Greek mind, to die for somebody wasn't even on the table. That was ridiculous. But you, someone, a good man might die for a good person. Might, he says. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of the rebellion, Calvary occurred. And he didn't ask you if it was okay. And then the coup de grace, after verse 8. Verse 9, much more than having been justified by his blood, we'll be saved from the wrath of God through him, referring to Jesus. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been, past tense, reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. This is an easy verse to pass over. We think, when we read it, that it's about us. For if while we were your enemies, God, we were reconciled to you through the death of his son. And that's a half-truth. What do we say about half-truths? They're not the truth. The we isn't you and me. It's you and God. Hey, God, why we were mutual enemies. That's right. We said to God, it's both active and passive. Why we said, God, we hate you. God turns around and looks at you and says, look, I hate you too. It's not one side or the other. It's the picture of a mutual estrangement that existed between God and human beings because of sin. When God looks at you and he saw sin, he says, I hate sins. Therefore, you're my enemy. What do we do with our enemies? What do we usually do? We try to wait to vanquish them. 
God, every, God had every right to vanquish us, right? Just take that old chalkboard eraser and just erase us right out of the world, right? That was his right. He was the one who was wronged. But in this state of being mutual enemy, being estranged, what did he do? He dies for us. He must have read chapter 5 of Matthew, right? Love your enemies. Pray for them who use you. Be you therefore perfect as your heavenly Father who in heaven is perfect. He must have understood that, huh? So what did he do on the cross? She found a way to make it so we're not enemies anymore. Amen. While we deserve death, by the cross, he was able to take that sin problem that stood between us and move it out of the way. And now with it out of the way, we are reconciled. We can come back together. Nothing's standing between us and God. He has accomplished by the cross the reconciliation. And if that's all he did, that would be enough. Now as humans in a sinful world, we're still going to die, but we're not going to die not being reconciled to God. And that's why Paul makes that next statement. Much more. And what is much more than the cross? While we have been reconciled by the cross, much more than this, we shall be saved by an empty tomb. By his life. And not just the empty tomb, but the life he lived before the cross. There we see the gospel. The life he lived which he credits to us. The death he died as our substitute. And the life he lives now as our guarantee. Amen. Remember Paul, 1 Corinthians 15? So that if Jesus had not risen, what? We're still in our sins. We have no hope. But because the tomb is empty, we have hope. Amen. We have salvation. Yes. That's the message that is all through Scripture, Old and New Testament, about what God is doing and has done to restore all things. Now, have you been restored? Amen. Do you believe you have? Amen. Are you still out there looking to see how much you can do to make God happy with you? Now, the sanctified walk is important. We should want to please God. But does that go on the scale of salvation? Yeah. Do, you know, do you all know that? I'm getting some who, who understand it. And that doesn't mean we don't obey, but that doesn't save us. Why? It's still filled with us. Still filled with sinners, saved by grace. That's what we mean when we say, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. That's the old song there from, uh, uh, who's a, I know who it is. Yeah, Gaither, you got it, thanks. I, I had that moment there, that senior moment. <laughs> thanks for saving me. Just a sinner, saved by grace. Now, it's not just the idea, just a sinner. But I am a sinner, saved by grace. And I'm not talking about sinning. We still messed up, like I said, but I'm not, but I'm a sinner, saved by grace. He, he has given me a new heart. He is transforming me by every day. Amen. But I'm not there yet, am I? Okay. You know? And so I can trust in him, not in what I do. And the fact that I want to do the right thing tells me what? that I have Christ with me. Christ is in my heart. He's in my life. As, as John says there in 1 John chapter 3, that seed that is in us there in verse 9, there is a seed in us. What is that seed? It's the Holy Spirit. And that seed will grow over time. And there's the transformation. So now we've been saved from the guilt of sin when Jesus comes, he will deliver us from the presence of sin. So, so this is really a very important text right here, verse 10. We need to realize that we were in a battle. And we all had weapons that were against each other. 
And when we come into relationship with Christ, we lay our weapons down. Because he effected the, the reconciliation. He did for us what we could not do because we were weak. And he died for us in the state of ungodliness. He didn't wait till we got good. And then this, he moves the sin problem out of the way that separates us. We have a lot to be joyful for in followers, being followers of Christ. Amen. That's the, what we want to share with other people. Can I share with you what Christ has done for me? You'll eat it up because they're carrying this stuff around in them just like you did before you had Christ. And you can help them lose this baggage. Just remember, when you're at the cross and you're giving your life to Christ with your baggage of sin, when you get up afterwards, leave the bag there. Amen. Okay? Don't pick it up and walk away. Leave it there. As I say, stand up and back away from the bag. All right? <laughs> leave it there at the foot of the cross. And he'll take care of it. And this is what Asaph was kind of seeing. And afterwards, when he come into the realization through the instruction out of the sanctuary, he was able then to share with others what God was doing. We're on the same mission. Maybe some of the points are a little more specific, a little details change, but it's essentially the same mission. It's the mission about God. And as Adventists, in this time in salvation history, we have an even more special mission. And we see in the three angels. If you don't see this where you're at in relationship with God to carry this message forward, please talk with someone. Don't carry this out with you. I know too many Adventists who still do not understand the gospel, and it breaks my heart. They have no joy. I have family members who've suffered the same thing and are now still suffering the same thing. I can tell horror stories. But when you have Christ and know you have him, you have peace like no other. Amen. And that was the peace Asaph received at the end. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great gift, for your words, for your salvation, for doing for us what we were not capable of doing. The restoration, we barely begin to understand. We know that we'll go through eternity understanding the cross and the great message of salvation. We thank you, Father, for this, for this joy. And may we continue to share it with other people, with our family and co-workers and people out on the streets. And may we enlarge the kingdom and realize that the gospel, that good news, is not to be kept from anybody. It is to be shared with all and whether they listen or not is between them and you. He didn't ask us to be successful. He just asked us to share it. So help us to share it with the joy, real joy, that is in our heart about salvation, about our connection to you, and about what we're trying to share with the world. We're not trying to show the world we're better than them. We're trying to say we're just like, we're just alike. We have a lot of the same problems but we found a way out. And there's the message. Nevertheless, God is with us continually. He's holding us by the right hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Carl, for that beautiful sermon. So powerful, nevertheless, makes me think about that verse 10. Yet when we were still enemies, God came and died for us. <laughs>